Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Michelle Sergio, Miss Music Teacher, and James C. Smith. Coming up on DTNS, what you need to know about the Ethereum merge, why the crypto folks are all agog about it, and what it might mean for you. Plus, Scott breaks down the first hands-on reviews of the PSVR 2, and why laptop users lie, at least more than phone users. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 14th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Who's ready for the merge? Or mm. for I mean, most I of think the it's going to happen whether we are or not. I was going to say, for most of the audience listening to this, how did it go? Because <laughs> it hasn't happened yet while we're recording this. Uh, let's start with a few tech things you should know. Microsoft Patch Tuesday came with a fix for two zero-day vulnerabilities, one of which is being actively exploited, so it's worth getting up to date right away if you haven't already done so. Windows Common Log File System Driver Elevation of Privilege vulnerability is the one that is being actively exploited if you're following along. Researchers at DBA at DB App Security, Mandiant, CrowdStrike, and Dscaler all discovered it. Mandiant told Bleeping Computer that it was discovered during a proactive offensive task force exploit hunting mission. Or, in other words, they went looking for something and found somebody exploiting it in the wild. In other, other words, patch your windows right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right this second. <laughs> if Thank you didn't you. understand anything else, that's the thing to understand. Uh, trio of legal actions, a hat trick of legal actions affected Alphabet and Meta over the last day or so. Uh, the EU General Court has ruled to uphold the European Commission's antitrust fine against Google, though they did reduce it from 4.3 billion to 4.1 billion euros, quite a savings. Uh, the court agreed that Google's requirement for handset makers to pre-install Google Search and Chrome in order to be able to license Google Play was against the law. Court found there was not enough evidence related to Google paying OEMs to exclusively pre-install Google Search, hence the reduction in the fine. The decision can be appealed, probably will be appealed, to the EU's Court of Justice. Over to the West for Part 2, U.S. District Judge P. Kevin Castell for Southern New York allowed a case to proceed where 17 U.S. Attorneys General accused Google and Facebook of unlawful restraint of trade related to the Jedi Blue Agreement. That's a 2018 agreement on advertising. And four, number three of three, we keep going west to South Korea, where the Personal Information Protection Commission fined Google 69.2 billion won. It's about $50 million US. And they fined Meta 30.8 billion won for privacy law violations, saying they did not obtain prior consent when collecting user behavioral information. But wait, one more thing. Amazon didn't want to be left out. So California filed suit claiming Amazon's contracts with third-party sellers and wholesalers raise prices and violate antitrust and unfair competition laws. Amazon requires its sellers to always list the lowest price they sell something at on Amazon. I love the idea that Amazon's like, well, what about us? Hey, we want also to be antitrust. Yeah, <laughs> we're big. <laughs> Come on. Nikkei Asia sources say that Apple will be the first company to use TSMC's new N3E chip making mode and upgrade to its three nanometer process. This will be used initially on the A17 chip for the 2023 iPhone. I mean, we're guessing anyway. And then later on in an M3 chip for laptops. TSMC also reportedly delayed Intel's orders on the updated node until 2024. If you don't know, in China, you got to get the government's approval to publish a video game, and uh, they haven't been given those out, but that finally changed. China's National Press and Publication Administration granted publishing licenses for 73 online video games, including titles from Tencent and NetEase. It had last approved new paid games from either of those companies July 2021. Big day for action camps. Uh, DJI announced the Osmo Action 3, which ditches the modular design of its predecessor. It can also shoot up to 4K, 120 frames per second video with its Rocksteady 3.0 stabilization on, and natively supports vertical video as well. It's available for pre-order now for $329, but... Not to be outdone, GoPro also announced the Hero 11 Black and 11 Black Mini cameras, 
which can record up to 5.3K video mm. and an open gate 8 to 7 aspect ratio. The Hero 11 Black is available now for $500 with GoPro subscribers able to get it for 400 So, you know, if you're already in the mix. The Mini retails for 400 available to subscribers for 300 shipping October 25th. All right, so one of the reasons we didn't get Max Scoville yesterday but are getting him tomorrow is because Sony and Nintendo uh, both had a bunch of announcements he had to cover. Uh, and among those Sony announcements uh, was letting press get their hands on the PSVR 2. People have been able to finally try it out in person. Still not coming out till next year. But Scott, uh, what are some of the things people found? Well, it's exciting stuff. It's the only uh, console manufacturer to make a viable and successful VR. So the follow-up is very anticipated. Uh, here are what, here's what we know, and here's what they found with their hands-on. Uh, this is a USB-C cabled device. This is not going to be mm -hmm. a wireless option like you're maybe used to with your, with your MetaQuest. So you've got to plug this into your PlayStation 5. Uh, no option for any kind of wireless But stuff. just the one wire, not the Correct. 17. Correct, one wire, that's it. Yeah. Exactly, and no but towers. Even one is different than none. That's true. All, and no towers, no outside tracking. It's all inside outside tracking outside. based on the device, which is a very, very big leap forward. Uh, features PS5's Tempest 3 audio tech to simulate surround sound. So, some cool sound stuff going on there. Uh, uses a really interesting optics technology called foveated rendering. We've heard this before, probably around the time it was announced. What this essentially is, is it's a way to reserve rendering power and resources uh, by making it so the the person using the VR headset at the time, what they are looking directly at is fully rendered at where, whatever, you know, rendering the, the game or the, or the experience requires. And everything else around it that's sort of in your periphery is just a little fogged out, a little faded out, a little less focused. Um, the best way I could explain this would be the tilt shift effect you see in mm -hmm. photos sometimes. Big mm -hmm. difference is with tilt shift, you see the objects, but you also see the foreground and background that are affected by tilt shifting. And it's all kind of one experience, whereas also, this is going to change dynamically as you look at new objects. It, I mean, it's not unlike how I feel like my vision is all the time. Yeah, if it's I'm a little looking tunnel right at you, right? Scott, then, yep. you know, stuff in my peripheral mm -hmm. is still there, but I'm yeah. not, you know, focusing on it. It's taking advantage of that, right? It's yeah. saying we're only going to resolve the stuff you're looking at. We don't need to spend computer power on the stuff in your peripherals. The, uh, Sony's not the only one doing foveated rendering. It's no. kind of becoming a standard on VR. So. Yeah, this, I think you're going to see a lot more of this because it makes a ton of sense. Some of the people on the ground uh, were saying that, hey, this it gives you the sense a little bit of tunnel vision, and I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. Others have said... It did feel like my vision isn't as good as it is in the real world. So not like a, a horrible feeling, but a bit of an unnatural, like why are things a little more faded out? And I think your, your mileage may vary depending on your vision um, and mm -hmm. what you sort of notice about things you're not focused on. So that's kind of interesting. Um, here are some actual features of the device. The headset features are two 2000 by 2040 OLED screens with approximately 110 degree field of view and up to 4K HDR. These are massive jumps over the previous model. Uh, support for 90 hertz and 120 hertz frame rates. Nice. Uh, you can expect the 90 is the minimum. That's good. That's where we need to be as a as a as a baseline. Lens separation is adjustable, so there uh, that that wasn't true of the previous device. Mm -hmm. uh, the headset has four cameras built into the front, and uh, that's in the front of the display for the headset and controller tracking. Again, no need for external trackers or cameras anymore. There are two IR cameras uh, for eye tracking. One IR camera per eye. And six-axis motion sensing system, uh, three-axis gyroscope, three-axis accelerometer in there as well. Uh, and an AR, AR proximity sensor, a IR, I keep saying AR, IR proximity sensor as well. <laughs> um, early impressions, by the way, on this headset itself is that it's comfortable, like the previous model. People like PlayStation 1 uh, VR's comfort, generally speaking, compared to the competition. But most are saying, yeah, but after a couple hours, you're still kind of mm -hmm. craning your neck. You're feeling the weight of it. It's giving you creases where you don't want them. So it sounds like we're not quite to the, you know, th that stage of VR where this thing is going to be super light on your head. Um, the controllers is an important point. Before this, it was move controllers. Now they have their own dedicated controllers. Uh, right hand has the PlayStation button, options button, two action buttons. Of course, your R1 and R2 buttons. Uh, right stick and R3 button, which is depressing that stick. Uh, left controller, same thing uh, for the left side. Haptic feedback across uh, both of these two devices, the two controller devices, one actuator per unit. and can also detect finger touches 
although it uh, sounds like it's mostly thumb and finger, for the thumb and forefinger, I should say. Adaptive triggers to register different levels of force. That's a lot like their DualSense controller and a very cool feature of that controller, I might add. Six-axis motion sensing. Uh, again, we talked about that. Capacitive sensor and uh, for finger touch direction. IR LED for position tracking uses Bluetooth 5.1. And it is a lithium-ion rechargeable battery. <laughs> it's a lot. What are you laughing about, Tom? Well, cause it's, a, it's a funny spec. Like, what isn't a lithium-ion rechargeable battery? These that's a good point. What other batteries are battery we using? It is is interesting. Yeah. yeah. The other thing that's interesting is all of these external cameras are designed to help do the positioning. This is a huge leap forward. You saw it first with the MetaQuest, as far as something that was available for people at home. Um, that is being used here. So you'll put it on, you'll do an initial scan of your room and there's, there can be mm -hmm. some additional adjusting after that, but it's supposed to be pretty good at telling where you're at and what you're doing and create these boundaries. Um, you can also very easily flip it so that you can see immediately outside in case something happens, you hear a dog bark or a kid cry and you can flick and say what's going on and you'll see the world, uh, via these cameras. So, uh, if you've done that with the quest, you kind of know what you're getting into the big standout in terms of demos because they did have some games and some stuff to have hands on with was Horizon Call of the Mountain. That one it seems to impress a lot of people. It's based on the Horizon Zero Dawn series, uh, the regular game series. And then the upcoming VR version of Resident Evil Village apparently is very impressive uh, with this device. Uh, I think the my big overall takeaway is good for Sony. It's a great sound sounds like a great follow up. They're the only ones that have been able to successfully make and market a a VR solution for the average home owner before the quest the question is now can they in the wake of the quest and possible upcoming headsets can they maintain that i think they have a chance to if they can sell enough ps5s to make it so you can actually attach one of these to it so there's that whole issue but uh, a good showing from sony overall i think yeah. yeah, I mean, as a MetaQuest user, <laughs> used to be Facebook Quest, uh, I, you know, I, I really like VR. I talk about it all the time. But I know that this is not the only solution that's out there. And going forward, it's going to be one of many solutions that's going to get better and better. You know, some of the stuff that you talked about, Scott, about, you know, eye tracking and whether or not, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, appropriate for people who might have, you know, different eyesight needs very much a problem in vr i mean yeah. i am i am for sure part of that demographic i mean i wear contacts if i didn't i'd be super blind but even with that thing on my head for a while like even an hour i mean an hour is really pushing it because i'm mostly doing exercise stuff and i don't want to do that for an hour sure. but uh but it i i'm kind of used to everything being like slightly blurry and then you just get used to it what I assume will happen is that uh, it will not be the case going forward. But uh, what you're talking about for for the PlayStation demo is obviously you know these games. And mm -hmm. if you you know if you've got if you've got a cord, got to plug it into the PS5. You want to play your favorite game? Super fun. You're not going to care about the cord. Yeah, the games you know, are going to be. I mean, a it would be great if you didn't have to have it, but you're not going to care about. I kind of wish one, they had a mode. I yeah. wish they had a mode in a store that lets you do it wirelessly, but that is not part of this plan, unfortunately. The one so. cord, too, is going to be easier to forget about than the yeah. the, the, no. the 15. I, don't, I know I just said 17. I don't know how many there were, but the old one was a lot. <laughs> the well, old one yeah. had a lot of cables. There's no question about it. And I talk pain. all the time of like, oh, being tethered. Oh, that sucks. There are lots of things you can do in VR where you're not even like jumping up and down. It wouldn't matter yeah, at yeah. all. Yeah. The yeah, big trick is don't swing your arm so hard that you yank your cable out all the time. I guess it depends on the game and how much movement you're doing. But games typically are a little bit more focused and you're less likely to yank that thing out. So I think I think they're going to be okay with a cable. It'll be all right. right. Let's talk about lying liars and the lying laptops they use. Uh, <laughs> let's do it. Scientists from Rutgers and DePaul uh, published a study in the International Journal of Conflict Management. I'm going to read that. Uh, finding that, quote, using a laptop prompted more self-serving behavior than using a cell phone, unquote. It's very interesting. Or as they put it in their article on the con uh, on the conversation, quote, lies are more common on laptops than on phones. Uh, explain this, please, Sarah. All right. Uh, I, I will do my best. So the study used a common research activity called the ultimate game. If you're in the study, you're given a certain amount of money. And then you're told to split it with another person. The other person doesn't know how much you've been given. You could be given $100 or $1,000 or a $1 million. You can tell them 
whatever you want. Maybe I say, Scott, I only have 10, but I really have a million, and offer them any percentage. However, if they reject the offer that you offer them, neither of you get anything. So in their first study, they told 137 graduate students that they had 120 to share with another student assigned to them at random. These are people who, you know, they're not friends. They just got paired up with somebody. In other words, a stranger. Half of those participants used a laptop to communicate. Half used a smartphone. What's interesting here is that 82% of the people using laptops lied about the amount that they had to share, you know, because they wanted to keep more for themselves, compared to 62% who were using phones. But Tom... There is more. Yeah, Scott, Scott Michaud in the chat is asking the pertinent question. Did they write the study on a laptop? How do we, how do we know? How do we know trust <laughs> yeah, liars. Uh, so, yeah, so they did the first study. They found that everybody lies, but laptop users lied more. So then they divided 222 students into buyers and sellers for a uh, pretend semiconductor factory. The buyers in the study were told confidentially that the property was worth $21 million. Remember that, $21 million is what they were told. The buyers were then told to tell the seller what the fair market value was and then make an offer, start a negotiation. $21 million was what it was supposed to be. Laptop users lied that the fair market value was $16.7 million, while people using phones said it was $18.1 million. So uh, everybody was rounding down a So bit. every again, everybody lied, yeah. but the yeah. laptop users lied more. More. Now, these are imaginary situations, but uh, people do tend to behave like they would with real money in these kinds of studies. That's been shown over decades. Uh, but do keep in mind that changing the kinds of tasks might change the results. More study is warranted. It's just an interesting first study. And these were conducted with strangers. So if you're doing it with someone who you have even a business relationship with or you're friends with, it would probably change the dynamics. I have a theory. I hope you guys are okay with me presenting one. But I have a tiny theory. And they didn't come to this conclusion. So this is Scott Theory 101. All right. But I get the feeling this might have some subconscious thing going on in my own head even where what I say on a phone feels more vulnerable um, because the phone can be lost easier. It can be ah. misplaced. It can be picked up. Someone knows my access right. code. They see so what just I just have typed. have a general feel, generally less feeling of security on a phone. Yeah, like I'm not, it feels like the phone is vulnerable in all those ways. Mm -hmm. And it feels like a notebook or a laptop isn't. It's it's locked down with a password not everybody knows. You can't just, your wife doesn't know your four-digit code to get into it. Like there's just, it just feels like a more sturdy, stable thing that's almost stuck to a desk, even though it's portable. And I just feel like people get more confident mm -hmm. in their lies there than they would on this other thing where it feels much more public. Yeah, I I tend to agree with you on that, Scott. I, you know, as somebody who I use my phone when I'm out and about, but when I'm when I'm kind of at home base, I'm almost always in front of a laptop, you know. And I've been chided for that a little bit in the past. People saying, "What are you doing on your laptop all day?" I'm like, "Working. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever people do on the internet. It's not different than what you're doing on your phone. It's just, you know, a little bit uh, different screen size. You know, maybe some more options, some more programs, etc. But, but there maybe is a little bit more of like, well, if I'm on a laptop and I've paid all this money for this, and again, you know that." Those, those numbers vary wildly uh, based on, you know, what kind of laptop you're using. You might, yeah, feel like, well, I'm trying harder. This is kind of my home base and I can get away with more. And I'm guessing they weren't using their own equipment. They were using a lab's laptop too, so. Sure. So that probably factors oh, good point. into yeah, it as well. I hadn't well. thought of that. Yeah. I think you're both onto something that the confidence when you're at a laptop is more, and, and, Maybe this is just me, but I, I feel like I'm better at everything on a laptop. There's more room. I, I feel more control on the keyboard than I do on the tiny little keyboard. And maybe yep, folks yep. who have grown up using phones won't won't feel that gap like I do. I'd be curious if this breaks down by age. But confidence leads you to feel like maybe I can lie a little more. Maybe I can get away with a little more. And if you're on the phone and you're like, ah, you know what? I always screw this up and autocorrect messes with me. So I'm not going to risk it as much. I, I think that could definitely. If that's on. the case, that kind of leans into this idea that this, this 
entire study isn't just about where people are lying or where they're not lying. It also is where perhaps where they're more confident and where they're less confident. Yeah, yeah. Because it doesn't have to necessarily be lying. I think that's really but the bigger takeaway. It's yeah. less about like who's lying and I mean, why. Yeah. The it's biggest more takeaway of just like they yeah. all lie. Everybody yeah. lies. Everybody yeah. wants the money. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but if you have a phone, you might be like. I'm not going to go like too overboard where the laptop people are like, I'm going to do my best. 82%. I, I mean, sometimes I'll get proofs back from somebody who'll say, you know, have you proofread this? Have you looked at this or whatever? And I, and if I'm on a phone, I don't feel confident in yeah. saying, well, let me just look at it on my phone and I'll let Absolutely. you know. I want to get home where I can get like a big screen and go, okay, oh, let's sure. see here. What yeah. do we have? So I, I don't know. There's something, there's got to be something to that. I wish there was, maybe we'll get more data down the road after whatever we learn from this, but it's fascinating. Sure. Well, we want you to be honest about what you want to hear us talk about on the show. So whether you're on your phone or your laptop, go to subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com, submit some stories, and vote on them right now. All right, everybody. On Wednesday, September 15th, around 1 a.m. Eastern Time, which we are before that at this point, but you might be listening to the show after the fact, the Ethereum blockchain will experience something called the merge, which will switch from proof of work to proof of stake. One of the advantages of a blockchain is that it's really hard to manipulate and alter the ledger. So if you are part of a typical database, you could get right privileges and kind of do whatever you want. We all do this. Well, many of us do this, you know, in work scenarios. But when people ask, how is a blockchain different from a database? That is one of the answers. The blockchain does not work the same way. Part of the way a blockchain achieves this, uh, you know, being a little bit more locked down, is by dividing up the maintenance of the records among many participants. So it's really hard to just be the participant that writes the latest record to the chain because that requires a lot of approval of those changes. You can't just go in and say, oh, I'm just going to change this sentence or whatever. It doesn't work that way. Proof of work is the way that Bitcoin and up until now Ethereum managed to qualify people, a.k.a. nodes, to write the records, a.k.a. blocks. Proof of work requires participants who run nodes on the blockchain to solve intense computer programs in order to qualify to write to the chain. So with Bitcoin, you get rewarded with a coin for doing this. Hence the term miners. Been going on for a while. Hence the need for lots of energy using computers to crunch away doing really nothing else but solving these computations so that you get past that particular point. There's a lot of concern, though, about energy use of proof of work, especially as cryptocurrencies are used more widely. So the people who use Ethereum decided to switch the entire blockchain to proof of stake. Now, you might say, OK, proof of work we get. But what is proof of stake? I'm going to do a whole episode of Know a Little More on proof of stake later this year. But here's the short version. It can work in different ways. But none of them require the use of a lot of energy to crunch computer problems. That's the big takeaway. Ethereum is doing it by requiring you to have a stake of 32 ETH tokens. Uh, and those tokens are uh, around $1,500 each right now. So not, you know, be a millionaire, but you've got to have some money to become a validator. You cannot spend that stake while you're a validator. And you can lose some or all of it if you do not carry out your duties, if you don't participate as a validator, or if you try to manipulate results. Now, participation just means running your software most of the time. So if you get knocked offline for a short period of time, it's a minor penalty. You're not going to lose a lot. You'll probably make it all back really fast. But if you just turn it off and you're not a validator, you could lose your stake. So it's an incentive to keep you in the game. Instead of the first node to solve a problem getting to write a block, like Sarah described with proof of work, in Ethereum's proof of stake system, committees are chosen at random. 128 nodes are chosen at random, so it's never the same group. You can't predict whether you're going to be in it or not. They then validate the block of transactions. To encourage folks to operate nodes, everybody who participates in one of those committees gets a fee paid in ETH. Uh, so you make some Ethereum while you're validating Ethereum. You, you're making interest off that stake. When two-thirds of the 128 validators on a committee validate a particular block, it is then added to the chain. And Ethereum estimates they have around 420,000 validator nodes ready to go after the merge. 
Okay, so let's talk about what the merge actually is. For almost two years, validators have been running a test version of the Ethereum blockchain on a proof-of-stake system called the Beacon Chain. This one will be merged into the official Ethereum blockchain. There's no set time for this merge, but nodes are upgrading to the new system right now. As more of them switch to proof of stake, the mining difficulty of the old proof of work system rises. It's just harder. Something represented by a value called terminal total difficulty or TTD. Once TTD passes a certain very large number, the proof of work chain should stop. I mean, if you still wanted to use it, you could, but it wouldn't make a lot more sense. It and within won't, yeah, 12 it won't work anymore. Yeah, within 12 to 15 minutes, the proof of stake system will take over. That is expected at around 1 a.m. Eastern Time, September uh, 15th, which may or may not have happened depending on when you're listening to this. Now, if it hasn't happened, you can get up to date predictions on when it will happen at portal.w2f or just search Ethereum merge on Google because lots of people are talking about this. And Google has a countdown clock on the search right at the top of the search. (laughs) Right, yes. It's either. Five minutes left, or it already ended. Once the merge is done, it's estimated that the energy use on Ethereum will fall by around 99.95%. That's a lot. Proof-of-work miners can keep doing what they're doing, like you said, Tom, but their blocks will be rejected by upgraded clients. So then what? Yeah, so once proof-of-work stops, new blocks will be proposed on the proof-of-stake system every 12 seconds to those committees I was just talking about in what's called slots. Uh, And slots are grouped into epochs, uh, and an epoch happens every 6.4 minutes. It's just a way of grouping stuff up for processing. Uh, A block is considered finalized. In other words, you're never going to be able to question it. You're never going to be able to reject it. It's part of the blockchain forever after two epochs are confirmed by two-thirds or more of the validators. When the second epoch after the merge is finalized without incident, that means the first post-merge transaction will be considered finalized. And that means things are off to the races. Things are going smoothly. Now, of course, in reality, it might take longer to finalize. People may have bugs. uh, Participation rates may waver. Maybe people are having problems getting connected or something. None of that is necessarily fatal. In fact, most test network merges have seen 10 to 20% drops in blocks, errors that then need to be remedied. They don't get lost forever, but it slows things down. But they generally get back to a normal pace within an hour. So the thing to watch for, if you're looking at this stuff, will be, do you see the logs go block, 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 Or do you see empty slot, empty slot, empty slot? If you see empty slot, then there's problems. Uh, You'll also want to see high participation, meaning everybody's systems are working. They're connected to the network properly. A participation rate above 67% uh, means things are good. The beacon chain, that test chain Sarah mentioned, has been seeing participation rates consistently at 99.5%. So that's probably what you'll see. And you might be asking yourself, well, okay, who made this decision? You know, you know, at, at what point did, did, did we all decide to, you know, go into, you know, Ethereum version two? Pretty democratic decision. Years in the making. Most Ethereal nodes are on board. However, some folks still look at expensive mining equipment that they bought and wonder, hmm, <laughs> can I still do something with this? Small group plans to fork Ethereum and keep going on proof of work. They're calling that forked token ETHW. They also plan to give it a 24-hour pad after the merge until they start seeing their new mainnet. So it's not antagonistic, really. It's more opportunistic. Uh, So we'll see if that gets traction. Okay, back to the merge. Let's assume that it is a little messy, Uh, but that things get finalized, bugs get worked out, and by the morning of the 15th, when most of you are listening to this episode, everything is running relatively smoothly. I'll pause for your laughter just in case it's not. But let's say it eventually is running smoothly. What will be the effects of this change? All right. Here are some things folks are expecting. One, you're going to save a lot of power because you're not using proof of work. We mentioned that 99.95% power reduction. Instead of investing in equipment and provisioning all that energy, you just need money 
to get into Ethereum mining. So it's going to attract a lot more traditional financial people who didn't want to mess with buying ASICs uh, and, and hooking themselves up to solar plants. Uh, so you're going to see different people get involved in being validators. Transactions will go faster. You don't need mining computers cranking away. That alone will speed things up. But there's also a procedure called shard ing with a d that lets 64 validator <laughs> committees work at the same time that means ethereum should process transactions at least 64 times faster than it did under proof of work you can do that under proof of work but it actually reduces security staking uh, is expected to return about 4% of your Ethereum uh, as you get those fees. Uh, it could go up. Expect businesses that offer to hold your ETH in their stake wallet for you and then pay you a little interest for the privilege. You're going to see a lot of interest-bearing accounts on Ethereum. And unlike Bitcoin, Ethereum is not just a coin or a store of value. It's used for smart contracts, so a lot of people build their crypto businesses on it. You've probably heard of DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. A lot of those operate on Ethereum. The ability to earn returns on your staked ETH expands what kind of businesses people can try. Uh, and a lot of people think that ETH might even be able to pass B Bitcoin in value. Finally, because staked ETH looks more like a traditional financial investment, and expect regulators to pay attention to it again. The USACC may reevaluate their hands-off stance and are more likely to view it as a security now that you can earn interest on it than they did when it was proof of work. Uh, but in the end, it's going to make Ethereum faster. That's a big one for you. It's going to take away the objection of energy usage because it doesn't use more energy than a typical computer. Uh, and it's going to be able to use for more things. So you are more likely to run across folks using it, whether regulatory effects make it easier or harder to use uh, remains to be seen. But it's going to change the way Ethereum is used and potentially make it more useful for everybody. And no more hoarding GPUs, right? That helps with that. You will not, so. not for Ethereum. For Bitcoin, you'd still need that. But for yeah. Ethereum, no, you don't need those ASICs anymore. That's good. It's good for us gamers. <laughs> Uh, what is also good for us, Scott Johnson, is to have you on the show every week. Oh, oh, yeah, I know. That's nice. But uh, yeah, let folks know what you've been up to lately. Well, if you would like to hear more about the Sony presentation, the state of play that Sony just did, or the Nintendo Direct that also happened, uh, there was big news across the board, not just PlayStation VR 2, but a bunch of games. So if you want to hear about the breakdowns and what happened and what we think of those things, check out the podcast called Core. I host that with my friends, Bo and John. We do this every Thursday, and tomorrow's going to be a big one. Uh, you can find all the details at frogpants.com slash core, or just search for it wherever you get your podcasts, and uh, give it a listen. I think you'll like it. Good stuff, as always, Scott Johnson. Also, good stuff from two of our brand new bosses, Eric and Shweta. They just started backing us on Patreon. Eric, Shweta, we're so glad to have you along for the ride. Yeah, they heard the call yesterday. And now, because they are patrons, they'll get to hear our extended conversation about Ethereum and whatever else we talk about. Tacos? Who knows? <laughs> True. Speaking of patrons, stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We talk about all the things. You can also catch this show. DTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2800 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow. Talking summer game news with Max Scoville. Hope you can join us. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>